for those of you who think uh, this has nothing to do with fourth, uh, it's uh, a long-standing tradition that in December or January, Jax uh, gives us uh, an update on the state of uh, the uh, world of quantum computing. So uh, this year is no exception, thankfully. Uh, on with the show. Jax, it's all yours. Thank you, Kevin. Well, uh, Arvind, the CEO of IBM, says they're going to be selling boxes in five years. Everybody I know who works there thinks that may be a little optimistic. But it's not that much farther out than that. When I started reporting for Dr. Dobbs Journal in 2008 or 2009 about um, quantum computing, um, uh, the joke was that uh, uh, William Phillips, Bill Phillips had said, the Nobel Prize winner had been asked about the chance of quantum computing and he said, I give it 50-50, that is a 50% chance in 50 years. Well, it's, um, you know, it's 11 years later and uh, people are selling boxes. D-Wave is selling, you know, quantum annealer boxes, but not full quantum gate computers. And uh, IBM is talking about having a product in five years. So that would make it uh, 16 years after uh, uh, William Phillips was saying um, maybe 50 years. So it's come along very fast. And I have a series of, I have a, um, a bunch of links to support some stuff I'm going to discuss, and I am I've put it up on the uh, web on one of my websites, and I'm pasting into chat the link to the HTML file of links that I'm going to show in a moment. So I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see here. First of all, um, one of the things I've been doing over the past few years is uh, my wife's website for her pottery. And this is her this is her website. It's all written in PHP and JavaScript and stuff like that. So I've branched out to full stack web developer, though I'm child, child level in that. And all the people I talk to my grandkids age are much better at this than I am. So here's my table of links that's up on that uh, site that I pasted into chat. And here are the links. One of the most gratif personally gratifying and exciting things that happened in quantum computing this year was the justification of something I've said over and over again, and I'm sure I've said it at the fourth interest group in the past. And that is that in, at one time, there were a certain number of quantum experiments that physicists would do in a year, but effectively every single gate operation in a quantum computer is a quantum mechanical experiment at this point. And I have been saying for years that I felt that quantum computing was going to change the theories of quantum mechanics, because all of a sudden it wasn't going to just be a few, you know, 30, 40, 100 experiments a year, but there are a few billion experiments going on daily in quantum computing at this point, in quantum mechanics at this point, because of quantum computing. And that turned out to be justified this year, quantum leaps long assumed to be instantaneous take time. The math of quantum computing does not take this into account because when an electron jumps from you know, level zero to level one in its energy state, effectively for the point of view of the math of quantum mechanics, that change is instantaneous and there is no intermediate state. However, quantum computing, uh, there's a fellow, uh, uh, Zlatko Minev, who works for IBM, he's on the IBM Q team. I, um, I, I've talked to him online and been in presentations with him online. Very brilliant young fellow. I, he must be 30, 32. Um, he worked on an ex, he worked on a series of experiments based, you know, running off of the quantum computing, where they were able to infer from uh, the re, the um, yeah, well, let's see from the process of how you read out a quantum computation, they were able to infer successfully, and it's believed to be confirmed 
that quantum leaps actually take a repeatable amount of time that you can actually measure this at this point. So um, this is an article in Quantum Magazine. Here is um, um With their high-speed monitoring system, the researchers could spot when a quantum jump was about to appear, catch it halfway through, reverse it, sending the state system back into the state when it started, which is the confirmation. Uh, in this way, what seemed to be quantum pioneers to be unavoidable randomness in the physical world is now shown to be controllable. We can take charge of the quantum. So that's an interesting uh, development, a very significant development in the theory of quantum mechanics, and it's come directly out of quantum computing. Uh, here's Arvind Krishna claiming that he's going to be telling Wall Street Journal he's going to be selling computers in five years. And that is a, a big deal for IBM that uh, is is essentially one of the you know greatest um, uh, you know securities stock entities in the world making a claim like that in the Wall Street Journal. It means he thinks it's going to happen, or it's going to happen pretty close to the time that he says it's going to happen. And uh, one little item in the Wall Street Journal article responding to criticism that the U.S. may be falling behind China and the European Union to invest. He said that we're still slightly ahead, which is interesting. If you are interested in quantum computing, the number of papers and videos and things like that, I can't follow it all anymore. I used, it used to be that I'd spend a year gathering information and then I'd make my presentation to the fourth interest group. Now, there's more stuff that comes out in a week or a day than I used to gather in a year. If this is really mainstream now, and the number of graduate students, especially incidentally from India, that are fascinated by this and betting their careers on it, there's just uh, the, the currently in the QuizKit Slack, there are 17,000 members in the QuizKit Slack. That's just IBM. You know, who, uh, the number of people involved in this is incredible. And QuizKit puts out videos every week. So if you have any interest, in this at all, it is so easy. It's like it's like you know, learning to uh, at this point, it's like learning to um, crimp a cable. You just go and get a video on it. I use that example because I did that recently. I actually had to learn how to crimp network cables. Finally, after all these years, um, there's just any number of videos that are supported by you know that come directly from the QuizKit team. That ex you know they explain algorithms and everything like that. Any kind of um, you know, basic stuff to rather advanced stuff. Uh, furthermore, um, remember that you can um, exercise yourself on uh, the quantum computers themselves through a web interface, the IBM quantum experience. You can go there and just play. Uh, there's no charge. You register. You just use your IBM ID. You know, there's, IBM is a you know single sign-on kind of IBM ID. And I've had the same IB, you know, I've, I've had an IBM ID for over 25, probably 25 years on their webage. And uh, uh, it, you just use your IBM ID login and you use either the simulators or real quantum computers and submit your jobs. There's there's pictures showing right now of how you draw drag and drop to draw a quantum circuit and then execute it. And you get your re reports and stuff like this. I've shown this before. At FIG, but I just want to remind you it's there, quantumcomputing.ibm.com. You can go play with this stuff online, live now. In other quantum news, uh, D Wave is still there, and they still will allow you for a limited amount of time to play with their stuff without a business relationship with them just for logging on. Uh, again, IBM is, is free, and you can do it all the time, and they're got to have a more ambitious uh, quantum computing model than D-Wave does, but D-Wave is selling machines uh, within their model, their, their quantum annealing model, which is a more, um, a, a, a more first step kind of uh, step to quantum computing. Um, here's Google works on quantum. And again, they're, operation is not as open to the public as 
IBM's is, but they are essentially using the same technology IBM is. They are using uh, the superconducting transmon qubits, which is the IBM approach and the Google approach. And it um, comes largely from the work of the Martinez group at uh, UCSB. Uh, Martinez group is effectively now fully funded by Google, but uh, jo John Martinez was the um, engineer who convinced me that this was really going to happen. He was the first guy I'd talked to who wasn't it, it, back in 2009, 2010. He was the first fellow I'd talked to who wasn't a, a physics postgrad who was having fun playing with this. He was a real engineer and he was going to make this actually work and become a engineering proposition. So it's, again, a superconducting transmon is sort of an anti-transistor. It's two layers of superconducting material separated by a layer of non-superconducting material. Uh, a, tra a superconducting transmon qubit has a, maybe 1,024 or more of these Josephson junctions in it, these, uh, these anti-transistors. And um, a, freak, a voltage variation on one side becomes a frequency variation on the other. That's how the, that's basically how the uh, transmon based uh, super uh, um, uh, superconducting qubits work. Another firm that that has that is working on the same technology on the same basis is Quantum Inspire, and this is in Delft, Holland. And uh, you can log in and use their stuff too. They limit you how many you can do a day, but you can actually create an account and it, it and and you can send jobs to it by IBM's Quiz Kit. Again, Qu IBM's Quiz Kit is a Python library for sending um, um, sending the uh, uh, the that you can send quantum computations to quant to back ends, simulators or stuff like that. It's got a plug in model. So different vendors are using Quizkit in addition to I it runs IBM computers. You can also, if you have an account, you can log into uh, Quantum Inspire and other firms that have built, Rigetti have built, um, you know, back end plugins. So you can use IBM's Quizkit to talk to their computers rather than write this all itself because there's a lot of classical math and matrix math that goes into preparing a quantum computation. So it's nice to use IBM's quiz kit that they had a whole team write all this beautiful stuff and then just use it to prepare your computation and send it to the back end to the simulator or to the physical hardware. Dave is telling me he doesn't see my, um, Dave Jaffe is telling me he doesn't see the, uh, the no. uh, it, it does, it, you, you, you click that link and it doesn't work. Uh, I didn't see the link, uh, but Kevin sent it to me, so I'll post it um, on the uh, SVFIG website. Just, okay. Oh, I see. Well, maybe I just sent it to one person or something. Maybe. Oh, okay. Does that link work? Let's see if that works. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. It does work. Okay. Very good. Anyway. Um. Another company that's doing this, they're doing a different thing, IonQ. Well, the first time I went into a lab and saw an actual working quantum computer that had two qubits and they were beryllium ions. I posted the link that Jack sent to the chat uh, in an email to Dave. Very good, thank you, Kevin. So, uh, Again, a lot of companies that were kind of on the quiet are now coming out and actively marketing their approach. IonQ uses ion trap quantum computing. Like I said, the first experiment I saw in 2009 or so, I went to NIST and there were guys in smocks with um, covered with dye because they're using dye lasers and a room full of mirrors and prisms and they were aiming laser light at a little circuit board that had a slot in it and they'd use air to blow beryllium ions into the slot and then they'd zap them with lasers and do two, bit, two qubit quantum computations with them and they're having a lot of fun. And like I said, this was my first, first introduction to actual real quantum computing. And it looked like they were having fun and it didn't look like anything that would ever you know, be marketable. But the ion trap quantum computing approach is also as opposed to the superconducting 
uh, transmon-based qubits. This is another approach because the math is the same or very similar. Again, these are quantum effects and they are actually taking the spin of ions in tra ion traps. That I, that's why they call themselves ion Q. It's called IoT computing, ion trap computing. And they are doing the interference between the spins and making the computations. This is another approach. They are working um, on this and they to also have a user program, Get Started, and you can play with their stuff too. And I, I, if I recall correctly, either IonQ or some of their business partners are using QuizKit and there's a plugin so you can talk to their computers directly from the same Python library, you talk to IBM's and, 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 and Rigetti's and all these other companies, um, uh, quantum computers. Rigetti, Rigetti is, is a person and Rigetti um, worked for IBM and he bailed from IBM and decided he'd make more money elsewhere and he's got his own company now. And they're using the same approach IBM does. And they're basically, you know, he thinks he can get along faster and probably, you know, maybe the business model is, you know, Rigetti sells it back to IBM after he beats them to the punch or whatever, you know what I mean? But this is another company. And again, they have their kit and they have their own kit and their own simulators and stuff like that. So he's got his own full, you can um, click get quantum and, and get involved with Rigetti's quantum computers. Uh, Xanadu, an, yet another approach. Xanadu, they used to have, they are using, they're going into photonic quantum computing. That's, that's very appealing. The idea of doing this with light, because this is not superconducting temperatures, or at least not the, the, the extreme superconducting temperatures that are required for um, superconducting transmon-based uh, quantum computing. It's a very attractive approach. There's a, you know, problems with how do, you, how do you get light to stand still so you can measure it and stuff like that. But um, so they have their own technical issues, but they, Xanadu in Toronto, um, Ontario is working on photonic along with other organizations working on photonic quantum computing. So yet another approach. Again, the math is very similar. Microsoft, Microsoft is pushing into Azure and they have um, their uh, Q-sharp language modeled on C-sharp, which they claimed in a presentation I went to was the first quantum computing language, which is nonsense. Uh, the first quantum computing programming language was written in the early 1990s in Austria. And uh, people have been doing experimental quantum computing, thought experiment quantum computing since long before hardware was available. So they're, they're, they have a big marketing effort and they have spent probably billions of dollars on their attempt to reach topological, yet another approach, topological quantum computing, which um, uh, it very much weirdly resembles Isaac Asimov's description of the positronic brain. It involves creation and annihilation, annihilation of, um, uh, of uh, temporary particles as the means of conduct uh, as the means of reaching a unified uh, a unitary operator so that they have their own approach but they have not managed as far as i know and nobody i know can tell me they have not demonstrated a real hardware yet they were successfully by 2018 had proved the existence of the majorana m a j o r a n a majorana fermion um Look up Majorana sometime. They're very odd characters. You know, one of these self-taught geniuses and um, committed suicide at a very young age, or something like that. But he was—he uh, he posited this fermion that was not discovered until um, not proved to exist until 2018 in the lab. So they're on a very, very interesting track. They may have Microsoft may have latched onto the best approach other than maybe photonic for quantum computing, either photonic or the Majorana fermion thing, um, topological quantum computing may be the most stable at room temperature quantum computing, but they haven't managed to make it, as far as I know, they haven't managed to make it work yet. So they're using simulators and other people's hardware at the moment. They have a big presence, uh, AWS 
you know, everything like that. You can, you can sign on to use quantum computers on AWS, but it's mostly simulators or hardware working on the uh, superconducting transmog stuff. Um, here's a um, kind of a bit of a, uh, I think it's kind of a puff article for Microsoft from Computer World, but it's a very interesting article um, because they do, from a marketing point of view, describe why you'd want quantum computing pretty well. Uh, and again, they 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 have been working in Delft, Holland, uh, to um, uh, that's where they managed to prove that the Majorana particle exists on nanowires. So this is, if you want to understand Microsoft's publicized intent, this article is a very good article about that. As far as videos that are fascinating, if you really want to understand how this works, if you're not, you know, there's, there's different, all kinds of different intents in the quantum computing uh, field. Some people are very, very concerned about specific applications. I know people work in mining engineering, they're concerned about optimization algorithms, financial people concerned about portfolio optimization, chemists concerned about um, protein folding, uh, they have all these problems they want to solve with it. Other people are abstract algorithmists. They want to provide the algorithms that all these people who have uh, domain-specific applications uh, will use to achieve their domain-specific applications. You have a lot of brilliant, brilliant mathematicians and algorithmists uh, working on quantum theory. It's like computer science. If you remember at one time, it was debatable the best way to achieve a divide on a digital binary computer and all these things that uh, Knuth summarized in 1970 with his uh, uh, basic uh, uh, computer algorithms. Well, we're below that stage of Knuth in quantum computing. It's, it's really in the infancy. So you have, you have the domain people, you have the algorithmic people, uh, you have um, people like me who are kind of the code monkeys of QuizKid itself, you know, who you know, understand, you know, have a very general and broad, but not deep understanding of the theory and stuff, but I like to play with it. And then you have the people who are the um, really, really brilliant about the quantum theory of it and the engineering. And there are two specific videos from the QuizKit Live series I'd that I've linked that I would like to point out to you uh, if you are interested in that aspect of it, because we in the fourth interest group tend to be hardware uh, nerds, we, 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 we flipped over Novix and Shaboom and, and, and RTX and stuff like that. We were all fascinated by the actual hardware that made, uh, and, and, and Ting had his um, era of neural, hardware neural nets and stuff like that. We were all fascinated by actual hardware. And if you really want to look at quantum computing solely from that without worrying about why anyone would want it, but just to like roll like a dog in a dead bird in the hardware. There are two beautiful videos of this. Uh, one is quantum engineering of superconducting qubits. And this guy explains how they work. You know, here you go. If, you, if Jack's incoherent explanations are not sufficient for you, here's the video that you will want to look at. And then this is off the other one that I really, really liked. Um, Jack Harris, a professor, he, he was the, um, I think he was one of Zlatko Minev's professors when Minev was, a, was, a, was an uh, undergrad, was, was, was a doctoral candidate. And um, single phonon quantum acoustics. If you have a very, very minimal understanding of quantum mechanics, you may not have heard the term phonon. And what a phonon is, and again, I'm not a physicist, I'm just, you know, a, a code monkey. A phonon is how a quantum effect makes itself felt in some kind of macro environment that doesn't involve like direct magic, magnetic interaction, obvious, um, you know, direct connection of, of atoms or something like that. Like, for instance, if you if you decode a quantum qubit by having a tongue coming out of the um, out of the qubit so that 
there's a field that in the right magnetic environment, the thing will actually oscillate and actually move. There'll be physical motion of this physical wire that causes a change in the magnetic field in the cavity and creates kind of pseudo particles as I don't, that's not the right term, uh, kind of like uh, virtual photons of motion. These are phonons. And this is how they attempt to read these things out without damaging the state of the qubit, how they attempt to observe this and get the right answer without making it drop its energy level and not get any, an accurate answer. It's the, 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 the decoupled reading of phonons as virtual photons in a microwave cavity and stuff. And if you want to understand how this works and what they are doing specifically, I mean, this, these, this guy sits there and builds things uh, you know, out, out of spare parts and stuff to make this happen. And he said, well, I used this tubing and we used it for that. And it, this is a fascinating, you know, uh, kind of hacker space, maker space engineering approach to um, how quantum computings are made, uh, are, are how the, the output of, quant of qubits are read. This is a fabulous, um, fabulous video. This is maybe, you know, maybe my favorite Quiskit video. So single phone on quantum acoustics. Uh, and then to um, let me stop now and ask if anybody has any questions, then I'll show two, two more slides real quick, two, uh, two more web pages real quick. Does anybody have any, any quick questions about this stuff? I don't know how co coherent I've been. I tend to ramble and enthuse but if anybody has anything to ask or say, speak up. Very good. Um, I'd like to thank everyone here and emphasize again, as I tend to emphasize periodically when I speak with Fig, how much of an impact all of you have had on my career. Uh, I, I worked with Pat, I learned from Ting, uh, Fig Ragsdale has always been part of Fig, and and the influence of Fig is I don't I would not have made it as a programmer if I had not run into Fig. I don't think uh, David, all you people, I uh, did a lot, and um, at this point, um, late in life, my mom kid my my mom is ninety four this year, and she kids me about it. She said you're finally getting some career recognition about you know. You should, you should have gotten busy earlier. You would have gotten it 30 years ago. She harasses me. Uh, I, uh, of course, I, I'm, I'm part of the Quiskit Advocate Program. This is an IBM web, web page. And here I am in a funny costume for a Christmas party. Um, but I used it as my Quiskit um, Advocate page. I'm officially an IBM Quiskit Advocate, which is a bunch of people who we help the other people who are learning quantum computing. And this year, in 2021, I was named, nominated and named as an IBM champion, which are 737 uh, people around the world who are considered to be uh, significant aids to development of, of IBM approaches and IBM software. So thank you guys very much. I think it's very, it's an achievement of FIG as much as an achievement of myself. Are you wearing a turban in that picture, Jax? <laughs> no, no, it's a hat. It's a hat. What it, what it is is it's it's my son-in-law's. He went to Churchill Downs, uh, you know, for the, the the Kentucky Derby, and he had to wear you know an ascot outfit, and he lent me his ascot outfit and his hat. Uh, you know, so I'm wearing the vest and and the suit for this son-in-law who's quite a bit larger than me. Uh, and uh, I think it makes me look like 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 a like like a Quisket rabbi or something like that. You know, I, th I think I look like a Hasid in this picture. But it's actually an Ascot outfit for Churchill Downs. I thought you were a turban. You're right, a turban charge. Right. Well, there is somebody here. I mean, some of these people. You know, this this is a woman in Pakistan, and she's in she's in full you know burqa kind of outfit. And stuff. These uh, quantum computing is very, very much an international thing. It's very, very big in uh, the Indus Valley, and uh, it's very, very big in the Middle East and in North Africa. I, you know, there's people online all day, all night, working on experiments. It's big in Australia. It's big in China. It's Singapore. Singapore is a hotbed of quantum computing. It's very much an international effort. And it's been a real eye opener. 
IBM has fairly complex guidelines for how to communicate so that we do not offend people. Uh, it's easy. Yeah, we've stopped, IBM officially has stopped using the term quantum supremacy. That was found offensive in formal colonial countries. We say quantum advantage now. Uh, GitHub, we now do not have master branches. We have main branches, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's become a very, very much more international world where we have to respect other people's sensibilities to conduct scientific and cultural and uh, scientific business. It was a major advance when the Newspeak dictionary became available online. They can update it uh, much more frequently now. Well, you know, I, you could you could look at it that way, but uh, there, there, I, I do see, see that in you know us us Americans had a very uh, what would you call it? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, cavalier cavalier attitude towards the sensibilities of other cultures uh, and and we don't understand how they got to the place they did emotionally uh you know some of these countries uh you know they uh, you, 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 china china it, it, when i was a teenager they were having a revolution in the revolution and cannibalism was being practiced uh India, just before I was born, as they partitioned India and Pakistan, 8 million people died in one month in, the, in, in communal strife. Uh, North Africa, Egypt became independent in 1950. Some of the other countries became independent all the way in the 70s. The fact that, you know, we have most of the money on the planet, you know, the, the Western world has most of the money on the planet and, 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 and ruled the world from the 1600s to the 20th century without any challenge that era is over now. And, and we have to adjust to a new world in which maybe we are primus inter pares, first among equals, but at the same time, we are not the kings of the world anymore. And, and we have to learn how to talk to other people on their terms that we do not pull cultural strings. And I, you know, I, I try to do that with other human beings. I mean, I, I, I don't, I try not to do things that make them feel that their beliefs or their practices are stupid. You know, I have to do, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I've learned how to respect other people, including Trump voters, Kevin. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> we have to be respectful of each other, even in America. Yeah. And we have Fundamental to, to the American experiment is that we are not the kings of the world or the kings of uh, the U.S. And I think that's what we need to learn, that, that we aren't, and that we can perhaps move the world state where uh, there are no kings. That would be very nice. I think that would be very nice, but you know, it's like uh, you, you look back in history and then you know, there was a, you know, around the year 1000, uh, the, the, the wise forward looking civilized part of the Western world was you know, Iraq. That was the pinnacle, Iraq and Cairo were the pinnacle of scientific culture west of the Ural Mountains. And the Europeans were, you know, groveling in the mud like in Monty Python's Holy Grail. And they were, you know, dirty diseased and they went on to try to conquer the Holy Land. And on their way, they sacked Byzantium, another Christian country. You know, that was, that was Europe in the year 1000. At the same time, they were building cities of gold in Baghdad and in Cairo. You know, so the shoes on the the shoe went on the other foot by the 1600s, but now it's the 21st century, and you know, and 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 things have changed, and and so it's we we do have to, uh, you know, we we can't sit there and say, well, we have the absolute truth. We are the children of the of the Western Enlightenment, and we know everything, and you know, and you should listen to us. That's not a way to make friends or get scientific or technical collaboration with other cultures. That's the way I feel. I mean, it's, it's not really about, I think that there's right, or, I'm not sitting here and talking about moral or right or wrong, which I think Bob Armstrong may be thinking that I'm talking about. It's not moral right or wrong. It's how to get along with people. How to get along with people. You gotta accept them on their own terms and I expect to be accepted on my own terms when I deal with them too. And it's worked out very well for me um, in the Quisket environment, at least, where I talk to people from other countries constantly every day, so. I will praise this group for going two and a half hours before we mention Trump. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, well, it's like, you know, bleh, enough, never again. Yep. All right. Does anyone have any questions about quantum computing for Jax? Endless, but nothing. Quantum fourth. And I think I may have locked up. Well, you know, the, the quantum fourth thing, it, it, it's like that. You know, Python, uh, other people are using Python here. And, you know, Python's a nice language if you come from fourth. I mean, it's totally structurally different. But again, there's a, a sense of simplicity there. There's just, you know, that little va that value is kept there and it's there in quiz kit you know how's the easiest way to do this kind of thing so definitely the approach is is very very similar as it is when you uh, elizabeth rather said something to me one time you know I, I made some parallel between fourth and something else she said well i think fourth is what happens something like fourth always happens when you deal with hardware at a very low level and you say, you know, me, man, you machine. And that, and the first step from in that relationship is something like fourth. And I think that's happening in quantum computing right now. Pat, did you want to say something? No, I'm all ears today. You're not muted. <laughs> All right, since uh, no one else has questions apparently, uh, I guess if anyone cares to hang around, I think Bill has usually uh, been uh, kind enough to leave the, uh, the thing going uh, so that we can chat amongst ourselves. Uh, we're gonna probably stop the recording at this time. <laughs>